Okay. Uh, Should I start? Yeah, so today we're happy to have Ken uh, continue our geometry and quantum field theory seminar. Ken. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'd like to thank Ibu and Jonathan and Sarah and Shlomo and Sikur and Alessandro for uh, co-organizing this seminar series and for inviting me to join them and to give this talk. And this will be based on works with Clay Cordova and Thomas Dimitrescu, um, both a paper that's out and then something that's in progress. And Thomas recently gave a beautiful talk on this to the Simon Center and Zoom World. Okay, so just to start with some motivation, uh, we could try to explore quantum field theory space. So when we first meet quantum field theory, we, we meet it in a small corner, which is perturbation theory around free field Lagrangians. Now we realize that there's much more. There's, uh, for example, we could start off with some more interesting superconformal field theories or conformal field theories and perturb them. There are higher dimensional theories, which is surprising because in free field theory, these higher dimensional theories would all be irrelevant, but they're not. And we could study compactifications. We could also ask about beyond six dimensions, but six dimensions is the maximum for superconformal field theories, and it's not known if there are conformal field theories above six dimensions. And maybe by studying the space of quantum field theories, we'll find some new phenomena. Well, it's already led to the discovery of many new phenomena, and perhaps some of these will be useful for the future, like beyond the standard model. So this is a very rich and surprisingly interconnected space. So when we study theories with renormalization group flows, there's this notion that the renormalization group flow is like flowing down. So we have some number of degrees of freedom and the theory space of couplings. And just like water is flowing down, or just like in this game, uh, you, you can flow down with some shoots. We, have, we can start off with a conformal field theory in the ultraviolet, and we could add some relevant operator, which is like a shoot that takes us somewhere else. And then we get to the infrared plus some irrelevant operators, which are like some ladders that we can use to try to climb back up. So just to give some standard examples of renormalization group flows in four dimensions, we could start, we could consider QED, where the gauge coupling is irrelevant near weak coupling. So the theory is infrared free and it needs a UV cutoff or completion. Or QCD, where the theory, where the gauge coupling is relevant, so it's ultraviolet free, and in the infrared, presumably it confines and there's an infrared free dual with pions. Or we could look at QCD with the number of flavors in the conformal window, where instead the relevant coupling flows to some interacting conformal field theory. There's the possibility of asymptotic safety in the UV, where some coupling that's irrelevant in the infrared maybe also flows to a conformal field theory in the ultraviolet. And then we could look at all putting these things together, like there could be flows to one conformal field theory, then turn on a relevant operator and flow to another conformal field theory. And there are many options, um, especially in flows with multiple couplings. And generally we can't follow these flows in detail. And we could also look at theories in higher dimensions. So if we look in five or six dimensions, gauge theories, the gauge coupling is uh, irrelevant, so the theories are infrared free, and then we can ask about what's the UV uh, completion, or do we just need some cutoff? So in five dimensions, there are many infrared free gauge theories that have a UV completion, which is a superconformal field theory. So there's a superconformal field theory with a relevant operator, which is the gauge coupling, and then in the infrared, we flow to an interacting superconformal field theory like SU2 with up to eight flavors. And this can't happen in six dimensions. In six dimensions, there's no relevant supersymmetric deformations. Maybe it can happen with non-supersymmetric theories, but we don't know about those. And instead what happens is, well, one option is we can have a gauge theory in the infrared, which is infrared free. Uh, the gauge coupling is um, irrelevant in the infrared, and then we need some cutoff in the UV. Or another option is to change the infrared theory by adding a tensor multiplet, and then the theory can UV complete to a super conformal field theory. And the way that it gets around this problem with no relevant deformations is that there's instead a moduli space where we give an expectation value to the tensor multiplet, and we go on the tensor branch 
and then we can have an infrared free theory of this tensor multiplet and the gauge fields. And then there are other UV completions, like we could in UV complete um, infrared free gauge theory to a little string theory or super conformal field theories to a little string theory. And I won't be discussing little string theories here. It won't really matter for this particular talk. So we can't follow the renormalization group flow in, in detail in general. So we can try to um, constrain it and then guess about the, the renormalization group flows. So there's a list of standard list of constraints. Uh, one especially powerful constraint is the Tooft anomaly meshing for the global symmetries and gravity. So the Tooft anomalies have to be constant on the renormalization group flows, and then they should be matching at the endpoints. There's also the intuition that I mentioned before about reducing the number of degrees of freedom. And in even dimensions, uh, two, four, and in six dimensions with supersymmetry, this can be uh, made precise in terms of the A theorem. There's the conformal anomaly A, which enters in the trace of the stress tensor, which decreases as we go along the renormalization group flow. Also, if it counts the number of degrees of freedom, it should be bigger than or equal to zero, and equal to zero only for a theory with no massless degrees of freedom. And these inequalities are all for unitary theories, and I'll be only discussing unitary theories. And then there's additional power from supersymmetry. We, there we have supermultiplets and supermultiplets of anomalies, which allows us to relate these different things like conformal anomalies and the Tooft anomalies. So our, our original motivation for this work was um, thinking about six dimensional, one zero supersymmetric conformal field theories. And there the supermultiplet of anomalies leads to an exact relation between the conformal anomaly A and some Etoft anomalies. So these alpha, beta, gamma, delta are some Etoft anomalies. One way to write the Etoft anomalies is in terms of an anomaly polynomial eight form. And so these alpha, beta, gamma, and delta appear in this eight form. And these quantities are the second Chern classes and the Pontryagin class for the background gauge fields. These are the background fields that couple to the stress tensor multiplet. So it makes sense that the stress tensor multiplets at Hooft anomalies from the point of view of supersymmetry uh, could be related to the conformal anomaly. Well, when you apply this formula to superconformal field theories that are based on gauge theories plus tensor multiplets, what you find is that there's a, the superconformal anomaly A can be written as some pieces that look basically like free field pieces, and then there's some piece that encodes the interactions. And these free field pieces have a problem in that vector multiplets contribute negatively. This is related to the fact that you can't form a um, conformal field theory with only vector multiplets, unless it's some higher derivative theory, which is non-unitary. So that's a way to understand why there's this minus sign. So this minus sign makes this uh, one loop piece, or tree level, uh, this, this is really like a free field one loop piece. It makes it often negative, but A, if it's counting the number of degrees of freedom, should be positive. And so this positivity relies on this interacting piece. And this interacting piece can be generated from a six-dimensional analog of the Green-Schwartz mechanism. So here I'm calling it Green-Schwartz-West-Signati mechanism. And the global part in that at first looks ambiguous. I'll, I'll review that later. But actually, it's not ambiguous. And in this, the beautiful paper of Omori, Shimitsu, Tachikawa, and Yanakura, Yanakura um, they stated that the Green-Schwartz um, mechanism must cancel all the anomalies involving the gauge field, including the mixed anomalies. And that fixes this ambiguity. Uh, so from the point of view of, of, of finding A, that turned out to be crucial to getting positive A. And so we wanted to understand better this statement that the uh, all anomalies have to be canceled, including the mixed anomalies. And this led to our study of mixed anomalies and a two group interpretation. So um, just to review some things about higher symmetry that I learned from, from this beautiful paper of Gaiato, Kapusta, and Seiberg, and Willett. So if we look at higher form uh, conserved symmetries, so here 
an ordinary conserved symmetry is a zero form conserved symmetry. And then we can look at higher form P form symmetries. And I'll only be interested in the continuous case here. There are also discrete versions, but I'll just be interested in con the continuous case. So as these authors argued, they, these can only be abelian symmetries. So I'll write it as a U1 higher form symmetry labeled by this P. And this has a P plus one conserved current whose star is closed. And so we can write the charges by integrating the star of, of this conserved current over some, um, over some submanifold of space. And we can see from this dimension, because we want the charge to be dimensionless, that this current has to have exact operator dimension given by this expression, where D is the space-time dimension and P is what form we're talking about. So this reduces to the ordinary expression for zero form conserved currents. So in particular, if we look at one form conserved currents, so there's a, a two form um, conserved current operator whose star is closed, then um, there are examples. So in four dimensions, if we have a U1 gauge theory, we can get such a, a two form current from um, from the Hodge dual, from star of the first turn class of the gauge field. So the uh, charged objects in this case are at hook loops. And in six dimensions for any gauge group, we can form such a conserved current from the Hodge dual of the, the second turn class. So here I'm normalizing the second turn class with some nice numerical factors so that its charges are quantized to be integers. And these are instantonic strings. So it's like an instanton in six dimensions. So it's a string. And then all global symmetries should be coupled to background fields. So in particular, these higher form currents, this, um, th this current, two form conserved current should be coupled to a B field. And then the conservation law for the current is related to background gauge transformations of the B field. So this background gauge transformation of the B field is a symmetry because of the conservation law. And the gauge parameter should be periodic because I'm taking this U1 symmetry to be compact. So the charges, like the charges of the string are integers. And so this, this fact that it's compact and that this is periodic will play a role uh, in a little bit. So that's why I'm highlighting that. Now there's a tension between higher symmetry and renormalization group flows. So in particular, if we look for, for example, in four dimensions, um, we can ask, for instance, in the case of QED, it's an old question, can QED have asymptotic safety? Maybe the theories, we know the theory is infrared free at weak coupling, but maybe at strong coupling, it flows to conformal field theory. And, but, but this actually can't happen if it's just ordinary QED. So if, if we look in a four dimensional conformal field theory, the conserved two form current is necessarily a free field. So because it's necessarily a free field, this is an obstruction to an interacting conformal field theory in a theory that has this two form current. So the only way around this is the two form current could be redundant. So in other words, it's zero mod contact terms, or it could be broken. And that's related to the fact that we can get a conformal field theory from a U1 gauge theory only if they're mutually non-local electric and magnetically charged dynamical matter fields. So in that case, there's, there's no conserved two-form current. It's just explicitly broken. And then F and star F, this is the field strength and it's dual, can get anomalous dimensions. And there's no higher symmetry. And, and this, this is realized, for example, in four-dimensional superconformal field theories on the Coulomb branch. If you have mutually non-local massless matter fields, you can have anomalous dimensions, and then there can be conformal field theory. But in that case, there's no higher symmetry. And there's also a tension between higher symmetry and renormalization group flows in six dimensions. So in six dimensions, unlike four dimensions, a conserved two-form is not a free field. So it's a, a little bit harder to rule it out, but the theories that we know the best are superconformal field theories. And in superconformal field theories, there's no superconformal multiplet containing such a higher form current. 
So it's impossible to have a higher form current in a superconformal field theory. So higher symmetry is an obstruction to superconformal field theory. So for example, gauge theories have a higher symmetry from the instanton string number. And so from that, we can see that gauge theories possi can't possibly connect to a superconformal field theory unless that higher symmetry is somehow removed from the theory, becoming redundant or broken. And actually, in the known superconformal field theories, uh, the higher symmetry is eliminated by gauging it. There's a dynamical tensor gauge multiplet, which basically removes the higher symmetry. And this shows that this gauged higher form symmetry, I'm writing it with a lowercase letter here because it's gauged, that current must become non-abelian in the superconformal field theory at the origin. If this were only an abelian theory, the current would be there. But if it becomes non-abelian, then because it's non-abelian, it's not gauge invariant under the non-abelian symmetry. And that's the way to eliminate it from the spectrum. Because it can't possibly be in the spectrum because no multiplet contains it. What, what do you mean when it's non-abelian? I understand if you say that it doesn't exist, but I don't understand what you mean by non-abelian term. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I mean is, uh, is that I don't, so, so I have to, you know, so, so, so this is an outstanding question, really, to, to make this precise, in what sense that the two form gauge fields are non-abelian. And so I can't really, I, I don't really have anything better to say about it other than it must somehow become a non-abelian theory um, at the origin. And we know if we reduce down to lower dimensions, then the tensor multiplet becomes, for instance, like the Coulomb branch of an SU2 gauge theory. And so there we know that at the origin, there's um, SU2 gauge fields, or, which are non-abelian. And so this, so, so the same thing has to happen in, in you know, the, it's kind of standard that the, the same thing has to happen in um, in the two forms of six dimensions, like in the two zero theory, if you reduce down to five, put it on a circle and reduce, it, reduce down to five dimensions, the theory at the origin is Yang-Mills theory. And so those two forms be become non-abelian uh, ordinary gauge fields in, in five dimensions. So e even though I don't really understand or even though it's not really known how to explain this in details, in detail, this shows that it's kind of must be required because if you're away from the origin, that that operator is in the spectrum of the theory. But then if you just look at the superconformal uh, representations, it's impossible for it to be in the in the representation. So the current has to somehow become eliminated in a way analogous to. Um, not just analogous, but in a way that would reduce, if you reduce it in dimensions to eliminating the non-abelian current from a theory. Yeah, so it's uh, admittedly hand-waving, but some, something like this has to work. Okay, so um, just to review the possibilities for anomalies in four dimensions, uh, we could have an anomaly with only gauge fields and gauge anomalies have to vanish for a healthy theory. And this constrains the chiral matter. And if this gauge anomaly is reducible, we can use the analog of a Green-Schwartz mechanism to, to eliminate this anomaly. If we have a um, triangle diagram with two gauge currents and one global current, that's the original adler bell jakeef anomaly which is only for global U1s. Since we have just one current, there's only for global U1s. And then that just says that then the U1 is just not a symmetry. It's explicitly broken by gauge instantons. If we have an anomaly with all global currents, these are the Atuft anomalies. So it's useful if they're non-zero because they have to be constant along renormalization group flows and match at the ends. And then, uh, what we studied was this anomaly with two global currents and one gauge current. So since there's only one gauge current, this can only happen for U1 theories. And then we can ask, what does this anomaly do? And we argued that it doesn't violate either symmetry. Instead, it deforms the global symmetry to a two-group symmetry. So I'll, I'll review how this works in the context of six-dimensional theories. But it, it happens already in four-dimensional theories 
which are like QED theories or generalizations. So there's a, this two group symmetry is associated with the one form global symmetry that comes from the first churn class of the gauge field. So because there's only one gauge field, it's this U1 and we can form this, um, this two form current and that plays an essential role in why this anomaly is consistent or why it doesn't cause any problems. So likewise, we could look at six dimensional anomalies which are associated with box diagrams. The, the box diagram with all gauge fields has to give zero. The, we can use a dynamical Green-Schwartz West Signati mechanism to cancel the reducible parts. There are at hoofed anomalies where all of the currents are global currents. And again, this is useful and there's matching if it's non-zero. And then we can look at these mixed anomalies. For example, we can have a mixed anomaly with two gauge currents and two global currents. And that, that will be the focus of this talk. And we could also, if the gauge group is U1, we could also look at the possibility of one gauge current and three global currents. Uh, I'll focus on this case, which doesn't require the gauge group to be U1. This, we can have this for any non-abelian group. And this again, we argue doesn't violate any symmetry. It deforms the global symmetry to a two group symmetry. And the two group symmetry is associated with this higher form current, the two form current that we get from the um, second churn class, the star of the second churn class. So it couples to instanton number. Okay, so just to, I'll, I'll mention some examples, six dimensional examples where this anomaly is non-zero. So we're looking for this kind of an anomaly involving, a, let's call it a mixed anomaly, involving two gauge currents and two global currents. So one class of examples is one one supersymmetric Yang-Mills with general gauge group G. So this is a theory which is infrared free. Um, I actually, I'll discuss the obstruction, which requires it to be infrared free. And it can't be a superconformal field theory because there's no one one supersymmetric superconformal field theory. It has string UV completions, for example, in terms of NS5 brains in type 2B. And we can get it from little strings in some decoupling limit, but it's immaterial here. So we just need to look at the one one, the low energy theory with the cutoff with the Susie Yang Mills. And the theory has a global symmetry, which is basically, um, so there's an SU2 left and an SU2 right, which are R symmetries that act on, the, on both of these two one one supersymmetries. From the point of view of, higher, of the five brain construction, these are the rotations in the transverse directions from ten, in 10 dimensions. There's the Poincaré symmetry in six dimensions. And then there's a higher form um, there's the one form global symmetry associated with instanton number because this is a gauge theory. So we can compute the anomaly di di anomalies from the box diagrams with the one one gauge genos in the loop. So the anomaly polynomial we could write as an eight form with a gauge piece, a global piece, and then the mixed piece, which is what we're interested in. The gauge piece is just zero because this theory is vector like. But once we turn on background gauge fields for for the global symmetries, we can get non-trivial anomalies involving the global symmetries. So there's a, these are etuft anomalies for the, the global background, the R symmetry background. These are uh, second churn classes for the SU2 left symmetry, the SU2 right symmetry, and then this is the Pontryagin class for the Poincaré symmetry. So these are some Hooft anomalies for, for these background fields, and these would have to match on renormalization group flows. Um, actually, the matching on renormalization group flows is, is something that I'll come back to. There are some subtleties there related to the two group symmetry. Uh, so, so when I say it needs to match, that needs to be reinterpreted, it turns out. And then there are mixed anomalies, which are coming from this diagram where it's the second churn class for the gauge fields. This is the contribution from the gauge fields in the diagram. And then some four form that we form from the global backgrounds. And if you work out the diagram, this four form from the, involving the global backgrounds is the dual coxeter number of the gauge group times 
these second turn classes of the left and the right background gauge fields. So this theory has a mixed anomaly, but it's not a problem for the theory. Even though this is an anomaly involving gauge fields, it doesn't cause any inconsistency. It just needs to be interpreted. So as another class of examples, we can look at um, another class of examples where this box diagram anomaly is non-zero. We can look at the one zero theory of n small SO32 instantons. Um, this theory was written down by Witten. And it has a string theory UV completion in terms of little string theory. But again, that's not going to play a role in this talk. So the theory has a gauge group, which is SPN. And then there's a half hypermultiplet in the bifundamental of SPN and SO32. There's a half hypermultiplet in this representation. It's two index antisymmetric of SPN, and then the fundamental of SU2 left. And altogether, there's a global symmetry, which is SO32, SU2 left, SU2 right, Poincare. And then there's this one form global symmetry associated with the SP gauge fields, it's SP instanton number. So we could compute the anomaly from the box diagram with the fermions in the loop, and we find gauge and global and mixed pieces. The gauge piece is just zero. This is a consistent theory, it's just pointed out by Schwartz. Um, the global piece is something which I didn't bother to write down, but it's non zero. And then the part that we're interested in, this mixed piece, has the form of the SP instanton um, piece involving the SP gauge fields, and then something that's formed from the global backgrounds involving SU2 left, SU2 right, and the SO32 background gauge fields, and the um, background gauge fields for the metric. So the, these are the coefficients that you get in term for general and small instantons. And again, this mixed anomaly isn't a problem. This is a consistent theory. It just needs to be interpreted. So the effect of these mixed anomalies never spoil gauge invariance. And the reason, so the theory is consistent. Um, it's also consistent even when we turn on non-trivial background fields. So there's no problem with turning on background fields for the global symmetries and violating gauge invariance. And the reason is that these are reducible anomalies. And so we can always shift things around with a local counter term to preserve gauge invariance. So here the counter term is takes the form of a churn simons term involving the, the global symmetries, a churn simons term involving the gauge symmetries. And this isn't gauge invariant, but um, that's, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to add it with the appropriate coefficient to preserve gauge invariance. So here this coefficient S is a free real parameter in the descent procedure. When you do the descent procedure for something that's a product like this, there's an ambiguity. And the ambiguity is the possibility to add this counter term with arbitrary coefficient. So we just adjust this real parameter S to preserve gauge invariance. Um, but now when we turn on the background gauge field, it, it looks like, so we put all the anomaly into the global symmetry. So it looks like the global symmetry has an anomaly. And so here, we're here, this kappa is the coefficient of this box diagram. And this looks puzzling because um, this is a global anomaly that involves both the background gauge fields and this operator. So this looks like some operator valued anomaly. And such operator valued anomalies are, are confusing. We believe that operators show that anomalies should be some statement about we write down an effective action as a function of the background fields, and then we see that there's some problem with background gauge invariance. And so Anomaly should only involve these background fields. And so we don't like this interpretation of this as an operator valued anomaly. But um, so what we can do is just cancel the anomaly. So this apparent anomaly reminds us that we have this one form global symmetry, and we should couple that one form global symmetry also to a background field. So we couple the background B fields to, to the one form global symmetry like this. And then this, this looks very similar to something that we can cancel, we can use to cancel this part of the anomaly. And in fact, we can restore the global symmetry for the zero form global symmetry just by shifting the B field. And this, this is always possible. If we look at 
the way that these anomalies look with the descent procedure, these mixed anomalies look like some foreform involving the background and then this operator, which is the instanton number. And we can do a descent procedure where this operator just goes for the ride. So we just do the descent procedure on the global piece. We write the global four form is D of, of a three form. This is like a Chern Simons form. The variation of, of this Chern Simons form is D of some two form. And then the anomaly is some global two form wedge the, um, the, the background, uh, sorry, wedge, wedge this operator, which is the uh, two form conserved current operator. And then we can just cancel this by sh shifting the B field. So we shift the B field by minus that same two form and then the anomaly is just gone. But because we've shifted the B field, we've modified the symmetry, trans the symmetry group. And so instead of, of an anomaly, we get a modified symmetry group, which is a two group. So the anomaly quantum deforms the global symmetry to a two group. So what's two group global symmetry? It's similar to a green Schwartz mechanism for the global background fields. So let's say that we have a global symmetry, which is some um, zero form global symmetries. Let's call that G zero. There's Poincaré symmetry, and then there's a one form global symmetry. And the two group symmetry has some additional structure constants that I'll call kappa G, hat kappa G, and hat kappa P. So these are, I'll call these two group structure constants. And what they do is if we do a gauge transfer, background gauge transformation for the background gauge field that couples to this G symmetry, or if we do a background gauge transformation for Poincaré, so I'll write that as like a local frame rotation, then the background that couples to the one form global symmetry has to be, has to shift by not just its usual background gauge transformation, which is this D lambda, but some extra pieces that involve the gauge background gauge parameters for the other global symmetries. So when we do the lambda background gauge transformation, that feeds into a shift of the B field with some coefficient, which is this kappa. Or if we do a local frame rotation, that, that also shifts into the, the transformation of the B field. So the B field has these shifts. On the other hand, we want to, to write the, its field strength, H, as something that's background gauge invariant. And so, so this is like the, the background, um, th this is the analog of the background field strength for this one form global symmetry. So, so because it's U1, we want it to be invariant. So we want this DH to be zero. And so we can do that by modifying the relation between H and DB. So H is DB minus some extra churn simons terms in the backgrounds so that it cancels off this, this contribution from the B field. So if we take the variation of, of, of this H, then B has a non-trivial variation which gives from these pieces, which give the churn simons terms, and then this Thing subtracts that off. But the effect of that in the end is that these churn simons terms in the background gauge fields act as sources for the H field. So H is no longer closed. It's sourced by background gauge and gravity instantons. And because we want this U1 to be compact with compact charges, or, or sorry, with, with integer charges, that tells us that these coefficients, kappa, have to be integers. So there's some quantization conditions on these coefficients kappa that follow just from this requirement that the one form global symmetry is compact. So just to summarize some properties about these two group structure constants, they're physically observable and scheme independent. They appear in ward identities. I'll, I'll write some examples of these ward identities in a couple of slides. Um, they're quantized to be integers because this U1 is compact with quantized string charge. So because they're quantized to be integers, they have to be constant on renormalization group flows. Also, they can only arise at tree or one loop level. They can't depend on coupling constants because they're constant on renormalization group flow. 
or, or sorry, because they're integers. Because they're integers, they have they can't depend on any anything, so they have to be only tree level or one loop. And there are simple examples in four dimensions and six dimensions where it's generated at one loop by these mixed anomaly diagrams, like the square diagrams that I showed in those previous slides um, for the one one theory and the one zero theory. So the one one theory and the one zero theory are examples with this two group symmetry. And as I'll discuss shortly, this symmetry affects Etoft anomalies and Etoft anomaly matching. And it also leads to some three point functions between the regular global symmetries, the zero form global symmetries, and this, inst and this higher form global symmetry. And so this three point functions between two little j's and one big j, it ends up being proportional to the true group structure constant. And there's this tension between these three point functions and conformal field theory. Okay, so if we go back to those examples where there were these mixed anomalies, we, we now want to cancel the mixed anomalies with the two group symmetry. And so we get non-zero two group coefficients. So in the one one theory, the non-zero two, two group coefficient, coefficients are for SU2 left and SU2 right. So, and they're given by the dual Coxeter number of the gauge group. So we have arbitrary gauge group G and these two group coefficients are the dual Coxeter number. And for Poincaré symmetry, there was no mixed anomaly. And so we don't need a two group coefficient for Poincaré. For the one zero theories associated with small instantons, we have this global symmetry with SU2 left, SU2 right, SO32, Poincaré, and then the G instanton uh, one form global symmetry. And we get this, if we look at the anomaly polynomial from the earlier slide, these are the two group coefficients that we get. And these satisfy these uh, quantization conditions that I mentioned, there's integers. And if we look at a general one zero supersymmetric gauge theory with gauge group G and no tensor multiplets and with hyper multiplets and some representation of the global symmetry and some representation of the gauge symmetry, these hyper multiplets lead to a mixed anomaly and two group coefficients. And we could write what these two group coefficients are for, for the general case. So they're just some sum of quadratic Casimirs or, or, or sorry, the index of these representations for the global and the gauge symmetry. For the R symmetry, it's always minus the dual Coxer number of the gauge group. And for the Poincaré symmetry, we can write it in, in terms of uh, contributions. This is from the gauge enos and this is from the hyper multiplets. Question. Yes. Do you have any uh, examples where you have tensor multiplets where you can calculate the coefficients kappa? Um, we, we, we could write down examples, but, but um, yeah, I won't be this, I won't. Um, so in the examples that I'll discuss where there are tensor multiplets, we actually won't have the two group symmetry. The tensor, the, the function of the tensor multiplets will be to gauge this one form global symmetry. And so it kind of gets, gets rid of it. We could look at other examples where, um, where you do still have tensor multiplets and, and you're left over still with some global symmetry. Um, and yeah, in principle, we could write down as similar expressions in those cases as well. I, I, I think, I mean, because I, I, well, I thought there was an ambiguity in computing the, like, what would be the anomaly polynomial for little strings when you have tensors. Uh, like, there isn't, like, a complete the square trick. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so here, um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because here, um, so, so I'll, be I'll, I'll mention something like that ambiguity in the case where, um, where it's determined by the, the theory being conformal. But it's if, if the theory is not conformal, then there would be still this ambiguity. Um, and right, so, so I agree, that, that would show up in these, in these two group coefficients as well. Yeah, I, I didn't look at this in detail, but I, I, that, that definitely makes sense.
Okay. Um, so, so the two group symmetry involved this, um, the, the way I wrote it before was in terms of the background gauge transformations, but even without background gauge fields turned on, we could see it in terms of the ward identities. And so then, so the two group transformation in terms of the ward identities tells us that the divergence of, um, so, so here I'm just writing the regular divergence instead of the covariant one because I've turned off all of the background gauge fields. Um, the divergence of this global current um, can have a, a operator product expansion with a contact term and the contact term ends up giving this the two form global symmetry current with a coefficient which is this kappa the structure constant so this is what we get from just taking the functional derivative with respect to the background gauge fields of the two, two group transformation law and so what this implies for example is that if we look at a three point function involving two ordinary currents and then one two form current if we apply this word identity then we can replace uh, this j this little j little j with a big j and so we get a two point function involving two big j's and this is something non zero and so so we get that this three point function involving two ordinary currents and one higher form current is non zero with this contribution to its word identity now there's another term that we can write down which is similar involving the the higher form current and the ordinary currents, which is like a pure contact term. So it involves two delta functions and an epsilon tensor. Because of the epsilon tensor, it doesn't contribute to this word identity here. And so we, we can add a term like this with some coefficient. Here, this coefficient, uh, this bold face K, is I'm taking to be some constant. Um, and more generally, we could look uh, it's convenient to write in momentum space at this three point function. And this three point function can have some a contribution with an epsilon tensor um, involving some coefficient that doesn't have to be constant. And the constant piece would be this contact term, but more generally, they're, they're non contact term contributions as well. So this is something that depends on the momentum scale. And these, the reason why I mention these three point functions is because they affect the Toft anomaly matching in some interesting way. We think it's interesting. Um, so if we, if we look at the Toft anomalies, so this is the Toft anomaly for a four point function of global occurrence in momentum space. So this, this would be the form of the anomalous contribution that, would normally, that we would normally get from the box diagram. And here I'm looking at a piece that's reducible. So I'm A and B, I'm contracting with delta, and C and D, I'm contracting with delta. So this is really like a reducible piece. And this reducible piece normally would have some Etoft anomaly coefficient that I'll write as kappa g squared squared. It's just to emphasize that it's a reducible piece. So normally this contribution here would just be that Etoft anomaly. But what we find is that it's, it gets an extra contribution from these current three-point functions. And so instead of the Etoft anomaly, we get this thing that I'm calling the effective Etoft anomaly. And the reason is, is because if we apply this word identity for the two currents um, relating it to the, the two-form current with some coefficient, which is the two-group structure constant, and we put that into this four-point function, and then we also put into, then we put into the four point function. Now we've reduced the four point function to a three point function involving this J current and the two remaining currents. And that three point function, we put in this, this other possibility with this function K. And all together, when we put the two effects together, it's a contribution to the four point function. So this effective, a Tooft anomaly is the usual Tooft anomaly plus something which involves a product of the two group structure function and then this extra three point function coefficient. Question? So, yeah. The four point function where you switch between coordinate space and momentum space, 
Does yep. this affect the four point function at non coincident points, or is this relevant only at coincident points? Um, yeah, this, this affects the four point function also at non coincident points. Yeah. Yeah, in general, it's, it's not like just a pure contact term. So this function big K, is, it's not analytic mu Q equals zero. Um, yeah, let's see. So there, there, so there's this, there's this one over Q squared here. Um, yeah, big K, big, yeah, yeah, I agree. So, so big K isn't just a contact. So if we write it in, um, so, so the constant, the constant piece, so there's a constant piece, but then, um, yeah, that's right. So, so this function big K isn't analytic at, at, at zero. It also affects three point functions at, at separated points. So, um, so this, so this, this has, let's see, right. So, so now I wanted to mention some effects having to do with counter terms. So there's some counter terms that, that we could add to the original theory, which are just involving the background gauge fields. So we could involve a, a term, which is like the background B field times the second turn class for the backgrounds, uh, global symmetry gauge fields. With some coefficient n, or there's a similar term involving the Pontryagin class of the background metric um, with some coefficient n prime. And these n and n prime satisfy some quantization conditions just because if we do the background gauge transformations for b, where we shift b by d of some one form big lambda, uh, there's a periodicity condition because u1 is quantized. And so that periodicity condition tells us that this n and n prime have to be quantized to be integers. So here, these counter terms involve integer n and n prime, and these are unphysical scheme dependent ambiguities. And they lead to ambiguities in the irreducible Twift anomalies. So if we, if we look at how, um, how these counter terms Basically, it's because when we do a background gauge transformation, we're shifting B. And so when we shift B, that leads to a contribution that looks like a, a hoof anomaly. And so there's an extra contribution to the reducible at hoof anomaly for the global symmetry, which is this, um, un which is this amb ambiguous integer N times the two group coefficient kappa hat. And it also feeds into the Etoft anomaly involving two global currents and two stress tensors. So there, there's an ambiguity, which is the same coefficient n times the kappa hat for Poincaré. And n prime also leads to ambiguities. So for n prime, it would be ambiguities in the Etoft anomaly involving two gate background gauge fields and two metrics. Uh, and then this is the Etoft anomaly involving just the metric. So involving, and this involves the um, kappa hat for Poincaré. And this, these contact terms also shift the three point functions for th two, two ordinary currents and one higher form current and a similar three point function involving the higher form current and two stress tensor. It shifts them by contact terms. And so these contact terms shift this coefficient, this, the constant part of this coefficient by some integer n. So that, that shows that these coefficients are ambiguous modulo integers. But this, this ambiguity cancels in the coefficient of the physical anomalous four point function. So because this, if, if we went back to position space, this is contributing also at separated points. And so it shouldn't be affected by these n and n prime. And in fact, the n and n prime dependence cancels out. 
So, so this is good, um, even though, even, so the etuft anomaly is modified, but this effective etuft anomaly is still physical. So at the end, we are left with two different etuft anomalies. So the usual etuft anomaly um, satisfies these properties about being constant on renormalization group flow and, and physical and only massless fields contribute. But once we have two group symmetry, those properties are kind of uh, divided up between the two different etuft anomalies. So the original etuft anomaly um, that, that we compute from, like for example, from the box diagram is constant on renormalization group flows, but it's physical only modulo these ambiguities. So here this n is some integer and we can shift it by, by these pieces. Actually, this condition that n being an integer can be relaxed if we have a topological quantum field theory. Then we could contribute, um, then we can have a term similar to these contact terms, but with some coefficient that's not quantized. And then we would shift these etuft anomalies by something that's similar, but with some fractional n. And so that shows that, that these etuft anomalies, um, even the physical piece can get contributions for massive degrees of freedom, like massive degrees of freedom in a gap topological field theory. On the other hand, if we look at the other etuft anomaly, the one that appears in the four point function um, of the currents, that's physical, it's unaffected by these counter term ambiguities. It's unaffected also by topological quantum field theories. They, they cancel in this difference. So only massless fields contribute to this part of the etuft anomaly. But it doesn't have a tough anomaly matching. It, it, it doesn't have, it's not constant on renormalization group flows. It has non-trivial renormalization group running. And so we have to reinterpret the renormalization group flow matching. So the change in this K effective, say between the UV and the IR, ends up being related to the two group constant times the change in this three point function K between the UV and the IR, and that could be non-trivial. Okay, there's also a, a tension between two group symmetry and conformal field theory. So if we look at the ward identity for uh, two group symmetry, we get these contact terms. And if we try to, to put this into a conformal field theory, these contact terms would also imply non-zero three-point functions at separated points. And so we would have some three-point function at separated points, um, which is proportional to this kappa hat. And for, for the, the gauge group. And then similarly, there would be a three-point function involving two stress tensors and the two-form current proportional to the Poincaré um, structure constant. And we can ask, are these three point functions okay in conformal field theory and impose the different constraints from conformal symmetry on, on those three point functions. And in four dimensions, it, it can be shown, we showed that the answer is no. These three point functions would have to be zero in any conformal field theory. And in a way it's not a surprise because in a four dimensional conformal field theory, this two form current has to be a free field. And so it kind of makes sense that these three point functions have to vanish. So any two group symmetry would be a conformal field theory obstruction in four dimensions. In six dimensions, um, similar constraints can be used to show that this three point function has to vanish in a conformal field theory. So in any conformal field theory, we would, we would have to have this Poincaré kappa hat being zero so if it's non-zero, that's a conformal field theory obstruction. And we, we didn't rule out this kappa hat for, the, for a global, ordinary global symmetry G, but again, it's not possible in supersymmetry since they anyway don't admit these two form currents. So um, what these obstructions tell us is that the two group currents have to be redundant or accidental in the deep IR or UV or the UV has to be, completion has to be something else, like a little string theory. So going back to our original motivation, 
Um, they're six dimensional super conformal field theories from vector and tensor and hypermultiplets. And the tensor multiplet plays a crucial role in fixing the problems from the vector multiplets. So if we look at the theory, this is the moduli space of, of the super conformal field theory. The super conformal point is at the origin. There's a tensor branch. This is looking at the theory on the tensor branch. And so the tensor multiplets scalar fixes the problem about the gauge couplings being irrelevant in the infrared because the gauge coupling is replaced with, with the, the dilaton the, or the scalar field phi of the tensor multiplet. And then the tensor multiplets B field cancels the gauge anomaly by the green schwartz west Signati mechanism. And it also gauges this instanton current. And so it removes the higher form symmetry um, that, that wasn't allowed in superconformal field theories. So if we look at the anomalies, the total anomaly is some one loop piece plus some piece from the Green-Schwartz mechanism. The gauge contribution has to be reducible so we can el eliminate it by the Green-Schwartz mechanism. It also has to have the correct sign so that we could eliminate it by the Green-Schwartz mechanism. And it has to have correctly quantized coefficients. So there are all these constraints on the gauge part. And then there's this mixed gauge global, global part that has to also be canceled by the Green-Schwartz West Signati mechanism uh, in a way that that's exactly th what these authors wrote down. But now we reinterpret it as avoiding two group symmetry. So, so rather than having the, the two group symmetry, we just completely eliminate the higher form current by gauging it. And then this thing has to be canceled. And again, there are quantization conditions. So if you look at what these uh, two different one loop diagrams look like, they have some term that's the pure gauge reducible piece with, with some particular sign, which in my conventions is negative. There's some coefficient, which is a positive integer, which is the B field Dirac pairing intersection form. So we'll write the, we'll write the pure gauge piece like this. We'll write the mixed gauge and global piece like this, involving some background fields for the global symmetries. And then we cancel both of these by the Green-Schwartz mechanism by adding a term where the dynamical B field couples to both the second turn class for the gauge fields and all of these background global symmetries. And then the, the DH for this, um, for the associated three form is sourced by instantons in the gauge fields and background gauge fields for the global symmetries. And this is what leads to these quantization conditions that I mentioned up here. And we can check that these quantization conditions are satisfied in all of the examples. And then the upshot of all of this by the Green-Schwartz mechanism is we add this extra term, which is this perfect square. Here I'm, for simplicity, just looking at the case with just one tensor multiplet. And so this, when we square this, it cancels off these two pieces, but it, there's an extra piece that we have from the square, which is this I-global squared. So the total Etoft anomalies are the one loop pieces plus this extra piece. And um, so, th so the ambiguity that, that Jonathan mentioned before, if, if we weren't, um, if we, the, the ambiguity would be that we could have had something like this where we had a different coefficient in here for the global pieces. And then that would modify these Etoft anomalies. But here, the coefficient is completely fixed by this condition that we cancel these mixed anomalies. And this extra term that we're left with is crucial to getting uh, positive A, conformal anomaly A. So if we look at, uh, for the case of rank one theories, this formula involving for A in terms of the Etoft anomalies, and we write down the Etoft anomalies as the one loop piece plus this piece from the canceling the mixed anomalies, what we find is that A is the one loop piece which had this negative term that I mentioned earlier. And then there's an extra piece, which before I called A interaction. Here, this A interaction comes from this Green-Schwartz Green mechanism from canceling the mixed anomalies. 
and we could write it in terms of the group theory factors for the matter fields. And this thing, this thing turns out to always be sufficiently positive to cancel off the negative pieces in the one loop term. So, so this is something that we checked for all of the examples. So, for example, and is this the last statement? Is it based on exam on examples, or do you have a proof that it's always positive? Uh, we we have we have basically a a proof uh, for these rank one cases. We didn't we didn't look at it in complete generality, but yeah, for these rank one cases, um, basically you can you, we have a proof. The, the proof is really just kind of writing down the most general possibility consistent with all of these constraints and then showing that it's positive. So it's, it's a little bit better than checking by example by example, just because everything is expressed in terms of group theory factors. And um, anyway, just, just to mention a particular example, if we look at SUN with two N flavors, so the two N flavors um, is to cancel the, irreducible anomalies and then we cancel all of the reducible and mixed anomalies by this the screen schwartz mechanism and so that leads to this extra piece involving just the global symmetries which is this last term here and this last term here we could see that if we just looked at the vector multiplet piece there would be this large negative contribution that scales like n squared and the hyper multiplet part doesn't help enough to make it positive, but this term is easily big enough to make the whole answer positive, which, which is what we wanted to show um, in order to interpret this A as, as so, being- So sorry positive. again, big, big N and big N I, uh, what are they in terms of little N? Oh, sorry, this, this little N and big N are the same. Yeah, so, so, so sorry, this, 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 is, this should have been a big N. This, this is SUN with two big N flavors. Yeah, I have a inconsistency from cutting and pasting. And let's see, but you were acting about NI or? No, no, that I was your cursor, sorry about that. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so just to summarize, um, it's, it's possible to have mixed anomalies um, with at least two global currents. If there's only one global current, then it's basically like the original ABJ anomaly, and it just means that the symmetry is broken. But if there are at least two global currents, there, this is a mixed anomaly that doesn't spoil any symmetry. It doesn't spoil the global symmetry or the gauge symmetry. Instead, it gives a two-group deformation. And in the, the two-group is specified by some integer coefficients that are RG invariant, and they affect the Tuft anomalies and the Tuft anomaly matching, and they obstruct conformal field theory. And in six-dimensional superconformal field theories, the tensor multiplets play a crucial role for many things. They cancel gauge anomalies, but they, but they also eliminate the um, current that can't exist in, in conformal field theories. So this Cons otherwise conserved current has to be eliminated by this somehow non-abelian structure at the origin. And so since there's no higher form symmetry, we can't have two group symmetry and all of the mixed anomalies have to be canceled as, as in the original paper by Omori and company. And this ensures that the conformal anomaly A is positive. At least we, we showed this in the rank one case. So thank you. Uh, any questions or? I wonder, you know, I'm sorry about that, like ignorant questions, but still, you know, this instant and charge uh, uh, objects are what, 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 um, I'm in, in terms of particle physics, uh, what, what could be the uh, like uh, sonic stuff in sixth dimension or, you know, I'm sorry that I'm asking this <laughs> triviality, but still, can you explain this? The, the, what are the instanton charges in, in six dimensions? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, 
it's you know if you if you just take basically the same kind of configuration that would have been an instanton in in four dimensions then in five dimensions you could reinterpret it as as a particle so you just right. have extra time and that's its world line and then in six dimensions we have one more direct direction so this is some kind of world line of a string in I six see. dimensions and but, that that string is being coupled to this background b field yeah, but when you are uh, mentioning that it could be kind of little or whatever, uh, does not imply that in certain way, in certain uh, um, event going on something like a sync theory, uh, uh, theory or or it's not uh, it's a long term topic. This. Um, yeah. So I mean. All, all of this could be put into string theory, and then if if we go and if we actually put it into the string theory constructions that I mentioned of these um, higher dimension of these six dimensional theories in terms of brains, then basically um, those those strings are like fundamental strings in term in terms of the original string theory. And no, no, but I, but I wonder that in this way uh, does does it doesn't imply that kind of the the local nature of the theory is lost. Um, no, like operator product expansion would not work, or you know something like this. Yeah, from I mean, just just from the point of view, so 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 definitely there, all of those kinds of statements could be applied to the string theory version. Um, you know, the original string theory construction before we take a decoupling limit we'd have to include the extra four dimensions or we could take this little string decoupling limit where we decouple the extra four dimensions and we're still left with some some stringy objects and and that's so that's some kind of exotic theory but for what i was discussing i could just think about like a low energy limit where we decouple all of these kind of exotic things that look non-local but we still have this possibility of, of having these instantons um, just as some, some kind of field configuration. Uh, we don't interpret them as, some, as a fundamental object, but mm -hmm. it's just some kind of field configuration. So I could still, from the point of view of the low energy theory, just think about this as some local quantum field theory. Okay. Although okay, it's, it, the, the examples are all infrared free and mm -hmm. You know, so but I, so that's why. Uh, b basically, I, I just I I could just draw a line, which is a cutoff, and just study the theory below that cutoff, and below that it's just some uh, ordinary quantum field theory. Thank you. Thanks. What is known about the finite group version of it when when it's not continuous and you have gauge fields? um yeah that's i mean as you know there's a there's a lot that's been studied in um for example in three dimensions um yeah there so there there are discrete versions of 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 this uh i haven't myself studied the discrete version of of these of these symmetries in higher dimensions but presumably there is some some analog of that can i ask you uh, what does the absence of this higher form symmetry in 6d imply for 5d reductions have you thought about that um Yeah, let's see. I'm not I'm not sure if it, if it I'm I'm not sure what it implies. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. In the um like like in the in the five dimensional theories that um Nadi and company first studied, they're the you know, of course the um instanton 
uh, symmetry, which there is just an ordinary zero form global symmetry that played some crucial role in that. So, uh, and, and there really was just a global symmetry. It wasn't being gauged. So the, if, so the statement is, is that the, the, it's analog in six dimensions has to be gauged, but I'm not sure how that feeds back into something in some statements in five dimensions if you compactify. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, question. So if you think of this construction as coming from a construction from a string theory, is this statement that you don't have these, um, this two group saying that um, in the string theory where you know that you have some non-trivial tensor hierarchy, which you should map to some higher form symmetries uh, for the theory, are you saying that those symmetries must necessarily act on the decoupled sectors when I try to go, when I try to go to the, when I try to study the conformal field theory? Um. Let's see. So, so we, so we, we could either look at the uh, string theory completion of uh, of the theories that do have the two group symmetry, or or the the string theory completion of the superconformal theories that don't. So, in the in the case where it's where the where the, it's a completion of the theory that does have the two group symmetry, then definitely um, these shifts of the B fields associated with the two group symmetry would have to appear in the string theory construction um, because there there are those global symmetries become like gauge symmetries um, for instance the so32 of, of this small so32 instanton is is some gauge symmetry uh, and yeah so, so so that's one thing that could be studied in the context of the string constructions or the the camp in a way, the distinction between the two is um, is is kind of whether, in one case, we have a B field that doesn't decouple when we when we look at the field theory limit, and then in the other case, the all of the B fields do decouple. So I I think once you go to the string theory construction, the two cases aren't really that different. So to to make sure I understand, so if I do the analog for n equal to four from D3 brain. There, if I look at the CFT, which is in the D3 brain, there is a decoupled vector. And that decoupled vector in principle has associated um, one form symmetries, um, which would be the thing that you would see in the string theory. So is, is that what I should have in mind? And a similar thing you can also talk about for the two zero, or any one zero by some decoupled tensors in a similar way in 60. Uh, sorry, I, th I think I, I, I was, in the, the first part of the question, I think I just got a little distracted. Was, um, was the first part of the question asking about like in N equals four going on the Coulomb branch and, and having some low energy U1? Uh, yes, for example. Right. So, so in that case, we would say that the, that would be an example where um, the higher form symmetry is just an accidental symmetry of the infrared theory, and it's actually violated in in the full theory by, you know, like the um, basically because we're we're breaking SU two to U one, there are some monopoles, and so those monopoles explicitly break the higher form symmetry. So. Um. For the case where you look at the D3 brains, there is an overall decoupled vector. Ah, the overall decoupled vector for the translations. That's right. So that overall decoupled vector does have a, um, a one form symmetry, which is a, for the, for associated with the U1. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so that would so be like a tree field because it's, you know, that doesn't couple to anything. So it's, it's, it's just some overall U1. I mean, maybe, maybe modulo some discrete things, there could be inter something, but. Yeah, so there could be some discrete ZN left over. But the question you're saying is that if I look at the string theory and I do have some higher form gauge theory, if I try to look for this in the, in the, in the dual theory, I will not find it in the CFT, but it could be in, in the decoupled sector 
such as this this center of mass mode of the D three brain. Um. Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah, in principle, that could happen. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, so the thing, the thing that's different in, in um, six dimensions versus four is that just, the, you know, free decoupled U1 vector multiplet um can't be conformal so so even if you have you know just like this overall translation for um yes yeah, so you could you could have something that's like a decoupled so so that's some kind of loophole where it's basically a it's still a free field um so there could be a free field higher form which doesn't, it can't have any interesting two group symmetry because it's a free field. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it's completely decoupled. And so then that wouldn't spoil the super conformal symmetry for, the, for everything else. Yeah, so, that, so that's kind of, um, that, that, is a, that is a possibility that you just end up with some decoupled, um, decoupled higher form symmetry. And then that, that decoupled part isn't conformal, but everything else could be. So in the 60s the example would be the decoupled tensor, which would be the, the center of mass for the, for, the, for the M5 rings. Or if I take M5 rings at some orbital, for example. Oh, but with, I mean, with the, um, Ah, okay, okay. Um, right. So the so the decoupled tensor is a free field. Um, yeah. So so again, the, 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 this is kind of a ends up being a loophole to um, because it's a free field. It ends up being a loophole to this statement that you can't have a um, a higher form current in a conformal field theory. Can you say anything about the discrete symmetries that come from to decoupled tensors, for example, in 6D? That's, I'm a bit confused about this. Um, yeah, there's, there's certainly interesting dis discrete symmetries, like, like the analogs of, um, Like the, um, for instance, come the analogs of of the discrete symmetries that come from the center of the group. That's right. Yeah. But um, yeah, I just I, I I think it's you know something interesting to study, but I haven't I don't have anything off off the top of my head to say about it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks. If there are no more questions, we can Zoom clap for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah. see you guys in two weeks. Next talk, I think, will be Clay. Clay. Or, yes, cool. No, next uh, talk. Will